Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Code Shakespeare Othello, Act 5, Scene 2. What I do in this series is I first give you a nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and then we dive deeply into the text of each scene and plug five or more quotes that I think are useful to help you understand the play's character and themes. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe and consider making a small donation to my Patreon account. All right, well, this is the big finale. It's the big bedchamber scene where he, Othello, ominously enters their bedchamber, their sacred marriage bedchamber, which is one of the dominant themes of today's video. We've looked at this before. But we're going to look at it again. The desecration of the holy sacred marriage. He enters that marriage chamber and he sees her sleeping uh, and he has a short soliloquy. Um, again, the cognitive dissonance is just raging in his head. He's totally at war with himself. But she, uh, she does wake up, and he does tell her straight up that I'm going to kill you. She defends herself, like the noble of Desdemona would, but he ends up killing her. She's not quite dead yet when Amelia enters uh, and tells Othello that uh, what, what's been going on, that Rodrigo is dead and Cassio has been wounded. Then Desdemona wakes up for a very brief moment, and with her dying breath, she exonerates Othello. That's what we're going to talk about today a little bit, about uh, Desdemona as a Christ figure, very much so. We've already seen that throughout the whole play, but here we see it um, um, much more clearly. Othello tells Emilia that Iago provided proof of Desdemona's betrayal. Now, we've talked about proof through this whole series. There's a whole series of proofs. There's about 10 of them, I think, and, and the big one, of course, the kicker is the handkerchief. Iago and others enter, and Amelia defends Desdemona. Of course she would, and she calls. Here's where she has her great awakening. She calls Iago a villain, and she reveals the truth of the handkerchief, the, the MacGuffin. That's the, that's the big reveal scene. And she stands up to Iago for the first time in the whole play. She, she, just, she basically says, I'm not even going to go home with you at the end of today, is, is, is what she says. Whether And she doesn't know she's going to be killed, but, but that's what um, she says. So she, she, she is emerging as the great hero, and we're going to talk about that today as well. Um, Othello then attacks Iago. It doesn't quite work. Iago murders Emilia, okay, and then he escapes, and then some other guys, some of these guys run and pursue him. A little bit later on, Lodovico, Montano, and Cassio, and Iago come back, and they enter, and they, that's the big reveal scene. You know, every you know, detective movie or every, there's a resolution, the denouement. We have to wrap things up, and this is where things get wrapped up. Iago partly confesses, and we're going to talk about this today. He only partly confesses, and that's important because... In comparison to Othello's honorable yet self-hating speech, his confession, okay, uh, Iago's is, is, is small beer. And, and what that reveals is uh, Iago's smallness of character in comparison to uh, Othello's greatness of character. Uh, Iago's, they also reveal that, Iago, that Rodrigo had, had written a letter outlining all of the manipulations and all of the deceits of, uh, of, of Iago. So, and then, of course, at the very, very end, uh, Othello kills himself. Othello is looking down at the sleeping Desdemona in the sacred marriage bed is where she is, and he's about to desecrate it with his violence. And he looks at her, and he knows that she's innocent. There's a part of him that knows, but because he's been incepted and manipulated by that psychopath Iago, Another part of him believes that she is what Iago says she is. Now listen to the listen to the torture in these words. It is the cause, it is the cause, my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chaste stars, because you're too pure to hear this ugly word that I have to say. It is the cause. Well, what's the it? That's what we want to wonder. That's what we're wondering is what the it is. Well, it's basically he's saying that she's a whore. This is the cause of what I'm about to do. I'm not responsible for what I'm about to do. Her whoring is. That, that was the code of the age, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But do you see what he's trying to do here? He's trying to convince himself that what he's doing is right. If, if, you, if you absolutely know that what you're doing is right, you don't have to convince yourself like this. You don't have to say, this is the reason, this is the reason. She is a whore, she is a whore, she is a whore. He's doing that. That's what he's doing. It's so, so painful to see for us in the audience, do you see? Because it's, it's that... It's that terrible, terrible dramatic irony where the audience is just screaming out, no, 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 you know she's not. He's alienated from himself because of the manipulations and the inception of the psychopath, which we've talked about extensively throughout this series. So go back and watch those. Alienation and cognitive dissonance. Othello still knows subconsciously that Desdemona is innocent, and he's trying to convince himself that his actions are correct. Do you see the rationalizations that 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 we can we we get up to as human beings? We all do it, and it's and and it very often leads to no good. 
once you have been incepted with some or once you've convinced yourself of something and it, if it runs deep enough then then Iago is not even in the room anymore but he, he is in the room he's inside Othello's head and the hand that is about to murder Desdemona is Iago's hand we become the agents of our own destruction once we've been brainwashed by whichever, whatever evil forces are brainwashing us so very very tragic words here uh, it, it reveals his torture and it's it's terribly dramatically ironic because we, we, we don't want him to do this and we, and we know that he doesn't want to do this either uh, this is a soliloquy so let's go through let's walk through this and make sure you, you get all the words yet I'll not shed her blood you see there he goes no I'm not going to do it that's the voice of Iago oh, sorry that's the voice of Othello nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow and smoother than as monumental alabaster so all these images of purity and whiteness which he, he does not want to desecrate and then he turns around and hears the voice of Iago yet she must die or she'll be betray other men she is a whore do you see this is this is what turns him around um, there is a, a bit of um, self-loathing in this and we're going to talk about it later on at the very very end his final speech contains this as well but here's a part of the internalization of the racism of Iago's racism now it's very interesting in this play very few very very few people are racist there's three racists and they're all they are all two of them are minor characters and Iago's a dominant character but he's the villain everybody else in the play respects Othello everybody uh, and and he is noble and so what allowed him to be incepted and manipulated by the by the by the psychopath it's his insecurity and so here we see in his elevation of 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 Desdemona's Venetian whiteness do you see he downgrades his own African blackness and we see uh that that self-hate emergent so we'll talk about that towards the end of the play as well at the very very end of the play actually so the voice of Iago takes over yes she must die or else she'll betray other men uh that's that's in terms of the zeitgeist I mean there's a feminist argument to be made here for sure uh in in the in the zeitgeist in the in, in the 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 ideas of the time uh it, it he is doing what the honor code of the age would have semi permitted him to do do you, do you see not not quite honor killings are still a thing uh they emerge uh in newspapers even today so in some cultures uh, that's basically what he's doing he's acting appropriately for his age then we get into the philosophical musings put out the light and then put out the light now of course the double meaning of light put out the light he's really got a candle here perhaps he wants to put out the light because he doesn't want the stars the chaste stars to see what he's about to do that's a Macbethian moment right you know hide hide thy fires stars and see not what my hand is about to do and then of course the other light is Desdemona's life so now we have the metaphor of light uh, symbolizing life if I quench thee candle thou murdering thou flaming minister I can again thy formal light restore should I repent it so if I put out you candle and I want to restore it I can easily light it again so that's no problem okay but now here's the existential question it's a great existential question the finality of death and this this theme comes up again and, and again in Shakespeare and in other literature as well but once put out thy light so there's Desdemona of course thou cunning thou cunningest pattern of excelling nature so there's the life force okay I know not where is that Promethean heat so Prometheus is the Greek god who stole fire from 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 Olympus and brought it down to give to humans I don't know where I can get this heavenly life force that can thy light reloom so I can't bring you back to life do you see and he continues the metaphor here uh, uh, well he changes metaphor actually but it's the same thing it's the rose if I pluck a rose I cannot give it vital growth again it will wither and die and so he leans for he leans into a, a testimony he, he wants to kiss her so he says I'll smell it on the tree now I all of these things I think are, are important to look at in in regards to what we've talked about in previous videos in terms of what the play should be about what Romeo and Juliet is a, a, is about is the sacred marriage and go back and watch my previous videos I'm not going to go into too much detail here but it's the the holy union of the op, of opposites the male and the female principles of the universe the cosmic male the cosmic female the, the the feminine principle the masculine principle must unite or life does not continue the union of opposites fructifies the universe it brings new life into the world this marriage bed that he is about to murder her on is the place from which new life of the universe 
in, in, a, in a symbolic sense, must emerge, do you see? That's what, that's what all of our hero stories do. It's the great theme of love as the redeemer, the healer, the spring and the font of life, the holy union of opposites. It's absolutely gorgeous. And all of this imagery suggests that. This is the life, this is life force imagery and they are in a bedchamber and that suggests this, do you see? Uh, and it's, 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 it's the villain, the snake, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, Iago, who has poisoned this, do you see, and turned it into a wasteland instead of something that it actually should be. Very, very sad. And so he leans in and he kisses her and he says, Ah, balmy breath, that dust almost persuade justice to break her sword. So you are so beautiful and I love you so much that maybe I should, you know, forego justice. He thinks he's doing the right thing. Please remember that. That's something to remember. Whether or not it's what, what we think is the proper thing to do today, absolutely not. But in his mind and in his culture, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as, as bad as we would think of it today. One more kiss and one more kiss. Be thus when thou art dead. So be as beautiful as you are when you are dead, and I will kill you, kill thee, and I will love you after. Okay, so he's madly in love with her. This is the cognitive dissonance. He can't, and wait for the language coming up later on as well. His language, once he kills her, his language is just, he's all over the place. It's disjointed. It's, it's like a shattered mirror. If you can look, imagine what a shattered mirror looks like. That's what his brain looks like even now. One more kiss, and this the last, so sweet was never so fatal. So he feels that her love, her sweet love, and her beauty is fatal to, to herself and to him because he's being murdered by her perceived betrayal as well. Uh, that's an old theme as well. You know, the, the femme, femme fatale, the deadly female, the deadly beauty, that's very true as well. I mean, psychologically, it's, it's very true. But here it's totally mis, misguided, of course. I must weep, but they are cruel tears. This sorrow's heavenly, it strikes where it doth love. Okay, so he, again, he's torn, absolutely torn apart. He has to kill the thing that he loves, okay? And then she wakes up. The motif of the sacred marriage and the corruption of the sacred marriage is further developed through a motif that we haven't looked at yet, which is the monstrous birth, and we'll have a look at that now. So Desdemona wakes up, and Othello basically tells her to prepare her soul for heaven because she's about to be killed. Uh, he wants her to confess and tell the truth so that she can get up to heaven, and she, she doesn't understand what's going on here. But he tries to convince her. He says, therefore, confess, thy, confess thee freely of thy sin, because to deny each crime that you've committed, if you, if you deny your crimes with oath, it, it will not, even denying it, will not remove nor choke the strong conception that I do groan withal. Now, that's the word I want to pay attention to. Whether or not you lie to me, whether or not you confess freely, it's not going to change my mind about the plan that I have. But conception has a double meaning, of course. One, it means plan, but the other one, it means birth, to conceive of a, of a, of a child and then to give birth to it. Conception is, is, the, is when, when, uh, when a baby begins its life, do you see? And so that alone wouldn't necessarily mean a lot, but look at this. Throughout the entire play, we've got five mentions of this monstrous birth. It, it begins at, in, in, in Act 1, and Iago says, I have it. I have a plan. It is engendered. Look at the word engendered. The word engendered is a, is a biological birthing image. Hell and night must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light, do you see? So he kicks it off, and then it's continued. You can, you can have a look at this. I'm not going to go through them all, but you can have a look at this. Uh, just take a screenshot of it, and you'll see uh, it occurs four other times in the play. Iago, Desdemona, Emilia, and Emilia, again, mention something to do with birth, conception or birth or, or something like that, do you see? So what I'm trying to argue is that, yes, Shakespeare does have this notion built into the play and reinforced through this monstrous birth motif, do you see? Uh, it is love is the redeemer. What what love should be? Love should be the font. The marriage bed is a sacred font of life, the true expression of the self, as we saw in Romeo and Juliet, a holy union of opposites, of birth as sacred, birth as holy. And then we have the corruption of that. We have the peripatia, the reversal. Go back and remember the beginning of the play, how wonderfully happy the couple was. They were the cosmic couple. They were the king and the queen of the universe, and everybody admired them and said, isn't it lovely? Um, look, even in our own lives, when you, when, why do we celebrate marriages? When people are getting married, there's a glow in the whole community. 
in your whole family, in your whole neighborhood, there's a glow, there's a sparkle to life when people are going to get married because there's the promise of, of not the monstrous birth. There's the promise of this. There's a promise of, oh, there's going to be babies in the neighborhood. It's great. What else is there, do you see? That's, it, it's, it's a lovely, lovely thing. And then we see the corruption of it, the peripatia of it, the reversal of that happiness, that reversal of the nobility of the sacred marriage into something base and murderous, more than base. What's more than base? Murder, I suppose. The language reveals character. He is using Iago's words. That word conception is Iago's, that monstrous word, you see? Words like engendered. Words like my plan is being delivered, DC conception. That's that's Iago's kind of kind of talk, and that's 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 Othello alienated from his previously noble self. That's the Parapatia. Very very interesting. Um, so have a look at that. Directly after that reminder of Iago's monstrousness and ugliness and corruption, we get the opposite vision. We get the, we get the vision of love as the redeemer again, Desdemona defending herself, defending her love for Cassio as something that is sacred and holy and pure. She's innocent. She's naive. Remember, we, we, we see what we want to see. We see what we expect to see. She has goodness in her, and so she sees goodness in the world. And she says, I've never loved Cassio except with the general warranty of heaven as I might love, do you see? So love is love is love. And there's a, re, re, a, a, a recognition that love does exist. Love is something good does exist. But it's, of course, it's, it's in this context, it, the dramatic irony is, is that we know that it's not going to be enough. That argument's not going to be enough. Othello brings up the handkerchief, brings up the handkerchief uh, as, as what he thinks is, is, uh, is, is con confirmation of her lies and she tries to defend herself and look how fast look the, the the dialogue is zipping by here because she's he's calling her he's he's trying not to listen to her and she's she's basically now she's reduced to begging it gets so intense that she's reduced to begging for her life there's the and, but it's too late he ends up he ends up killing her she's not quite dead yet but she's pretty much dead and then emilia knocks at the door emilia the hero emerges too late just like friar lawrence as as we talk about emilia in this final scene keep friar lawrence in mind the hero emerges too late do you see um so she's banging on the door and he has murdered her and now hey, look at the syntax here's a good good language term for you look at the syntax here shall she come in emilia word good i think she stirs again no What's best to do? Look at that. Now compare that syntax, that fragmented, dis disjointed, uh, questioning language. Compare that to the steadfast, the earnest, the, 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 the steady hand of, of the great general that we saw at the beginning of the play. Here is Peripatia indeed, do you see? Alienated from his true self. This isn't the true Othello. This is the, this is the Othello that has, that is, that has absorbed the, 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 the psyche of, of, of Iago and the psyche of Iago is at war with the noble psyche of Othello. Do you see? Isn't that interesting? So language reveals character here, his mental state. He's, he's totally fragmented. He doesn't know what on earth he's doing. Uh, eventually, uh, she comes in. Uh, e e Emilia will come in, in in just a moment. He continues his, 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 his uh, disjointed rantings. He says, Methinks it should be now a huge eclipse of sun and moon, and that the affrighted globe should yawn at alteration. Now, there's an old notion, and if you've, if you've studied Macbeth in any detail whatsoever, you've heard of the great chain of being, or uh, Julius Caesar, by the way. There, there was a notion, uh, uh, an old notion, the great chain of being. Uh, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but you can look it up. It's just a, there's God in heaven, then there's the king, and then there's all the other levels of the universe, of, of, of humanity and nature, do you see? And, and the, the conduit through which God's grace, the conduit through which the Promethean heat, the, the life force enters the universe, all goodness enters the universe through the conduit of the king or the queen. If you kill that, that's what happens in Macbeth, and if that's what happens in, 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 uh, in uh, Julius Caesar, if you cut that off, then you sever the connection to, 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 the, to goodness, and the spirits of hell are given free reign on, on earth, do you see? And so here, there's a hint of that here. There's that sun and the moon that we've talked about. There's the solar masculine power, the feminine lunar power, and everything is now turned upside down because he's destroyed the symbolic fructifying point 
of nature, do you see? He's corrupted it. He's allowed it to be corrupted by, by Iago. So that the, the stars, the affrighted globe, everything is turned upside down. Everything is yawning. The universe is yawning in alteration. Everything now has changed, and indeed it has. That's how it feels. If your life has been turned upside down, you, we, we say that. My world has been turned upside down. Well, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're working at a symbolic level of drama, it's not just your world that's been turned upside down. It's the entire world. And if you are the king, like Macbeth or Julius Caesar, then it is literally what they would believe would be the entire world is turned upside down. So big, big stuff. Amelia enters and reveals to Othello that Rodrigo has been murdered and Cassio has been wounded. And, uh, and Desdemona wakes up briefly and she says, oh, falsely, falsely murdered. And she's talking about herself there, I believe. And then Amelia hears that and, and begins to suspect that something bad has happened. And remember, uh, uh, Desdemona is behind a curtain, you see, because the beds had curtains around it. So, so Amelia can't immediately see uh, Desdemona's body. And she, her final words are the words of a Christ figure. She says, a guiltless death I die, I am innocent, and Christ was certainly innocent. And not only that, but like Christ, the Redeemer, she sacrifices herself, do you see? She says, Amelia says, who has done this deed, do you see? And she refuses to accuse Othello, very much like Christ says on the cross when the, when the Romans were torturing um, him, he says to God, he says, um, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. Now, I'm not analyzing this this play in christian terms at all we can think of the, the 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 religious aspect of it merely as a symbol if we want to if you if you're so inclined to think of it in other terms then fine but in in a, in a simply uh, symbolic sense people like this do exist people like christ exist the selfless people she's full of love and her love is is beyond the human and when your love is beyond the range of human normal human capacity what are you you're the hero. You're the hero. And what is Christ? The redeeming hero. What is Harry Potter? The redeeming hero who has superhuman capacity to confront evil and, and, and take it down regardless of temptation and, and everything else, do you see? So that's what she is. She is that redeeming hero, and it's actually quite lovely. Um, it's complex, though. She says, nobody did this to me. I did it to myself. Farewell, commend me to my kind Lord. Should she, does Othello deserve her love? You could give it another reading and, and argue that she's just being naive and foolish. Sure, I, it'd be hard to disagree with it, but it's hard to disagree with the fact that when we do encounter these people who are so filled with love that they refuse to see love in other people, it's hard to see them as something, the holy fool, the holy fool is something that we, we want to believe in, do you see? At the same time, you want to smack them for being so stupidly naive, right? That's, that's the complexity of it. So things start to unravel here, and Amelia is starting to, to catch on to what happened here, and she is being tortured herself. She, she lays into Othello here and says, you fool, you fool. And she, gets, she, she, she lays it on really, really heavy, and she goes back to his, uh, his otherness status as, as a non-Venetian and as a black person, you blacker, and you the blacker devil, uh, and for good reason. And Othello here, she doesn't prove him wrong. He is a devil, do you see? And if we use darkness as, as a symbol of, of, of evil, then he certainly is. He's, he's playing that role perfectly because he's been incepted into that role and he's bought, he's, he's, he's self, he's, he's self, he believes the racism that he's, that he's been, uh, that he's been uh, um, convinced that he should believe. Look at that. Cassio did tup her. That's a, that, go back and, and, and control F. Control find that word top in your text, in your digital text, and you'll see it's Iago's word. He, he yells out to Brabantio, remember from the on the balcony, he says, an old black ram is tupping your white you. Very early in the play, Iago introduces that kind of racism, DC, which Othello and the, the heroes Othello and Desdemona had resisted uh, until he couldn't anymore, do you see? So he's alienated from himself. He's been manipulated. There's that, that, that horrible reminder of... Uh, of, of who he has become in comparison to who he was, the noble man who he was. And here, all these grand themes, if you go back and watch my previous videos, I've talked about all these things, psychopathology, the, 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 the weird and very real danger of, of manipulation and inception, biopsychopath, your, your ability to believe appearances versus reality. If you're gullible and he's gullible, Othello's gullible because of his, his outsider status. Yes. 
he says to Amelia, your husband told me, your husband set me straight about this whore. Your husband set me straight. He is an honest man, a man that hates slime and the things that stick to filthy deeds. He hates corruption. He's an honest, honest man. Do you see how far gone he's sunk? Do you see how deeply he's been incepted? His vulnerability as an outsider, as I've talked about many, many times, has allowed him to become Iago. His, his love has been reduced to crude sex, the corruption of the sacred marriage, the peripatia. He's fallen from his graceful, noble self to who he is now. Nobility versus baseness, language revealing character. Iago's voice is what we're hearing here, do you see? Tupping, tupping, tupping. Crude, that's who he has become now, the alienation from the self. That's my argument. Um, now, Amelia becomes the hero. And Amelia calls her husband a liar. Othello tells her to be quiet, and she says, Oh, I'm not. Oh, you gull, you dolt, you idiot, as ignorant as dirt. Thou hast done a deed. I care not for thy sword. So she, look how brave she is. She's ready, to, she's ready to die. I'll make thee known, though I lost 20 lives. Help, 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 murder. So she calls out for help, and then everybody enters. So here she is, finally. She's courageous. She's heroic. She, her shadow is emerging but too late, do you see? The shadow is that is the dark side of us that's able to stand up to people and to do harm to other people. Here she's willing to do harm both to her, her husband and to Othello, the previously noble Othello. She's able to do that. She should have done that long time ago, do you see? Um, she's also feeling terribly guilty, as we see right here. So she, she's, she's a damned lie, a damned lie. You were told a lie, my husband told you a lie. And Iago is here, is here and he's telling her to shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. And she says, I will not, I will not. You can't, look what she says here, villainy, villainy, villainy. Now here we get to the crux of it as well, her own culpability, she says, I think upon it. She can't imagine what's happened here and she knows that it's because of her and that stupid handkerchief. I think, I smell it, oh villainy, I thought so then. I'll kill myself for grief. Now, there have been hints, and I've, I've argued that she's a very complex, that Amelia's a very complex character. We, I asked the question in previous videos, why on earth would she take the handkerchief that she knew was valuable to, to Othello and Desdemona? Why would she take that and give it to her husband, whom she's been living with for the past however many years, and she must know is kind of a creepy guy at some level of her being. Do you see, why would she give it to him? And my argument was that she, res she, she secretly resents the happiness that Iago, that, that Othello and Desdemona have in the same way that we all resent happy friends. You can't stand being around a super happy friend all the time. You want to smack them because you're not as happy as they are. Do you see what I'm saying? You want to bring them down to your level if you can't rise up to their level of happiness. That's what human beings are like. It's the Cain and Abel story. And so she recognizes that uh, in, 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 in herself. And I think that's one reason why she, she gave the handkerchief away. And now, but the difference is, Iago feels that same resentment. Iago, the reason why Iago's doing all this is to bring Othello down, to bring Cassio down because Iago isn't where they are, do you see? It's that resentment. Nietzsche's raisonnement, look it up, it's massive, it's huge, it, it, it's the cause of so much misery in life. The difference between Emilia and Iago, however, is that she's not a psychopath. Here she's feeling the guilt, do you see? If you're a psychopath, you feel no guilt. You can't, you can't feel guilt. It's biologically impossible and you can't feel empathy. Here Emilia knows that she did something wrong. She's human, she's frail. I've had nasty thoughts about my friend's happiness. Do you see? It's like, ugh, congratulations. Urgh. I wish that was me instead of you. Do you see? We've all had that, but we're not psychopaths, so we don't do what Iago did, do you see? So that's the difference between her and him. But she's a complex character. She's very, very interesting. If you have to write an essay, write an essay about her. She's, she's one of the most interesting characters in the play, I think. Uh, are you crazy? Iago says, go home. He's resorting to the, 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 the tyrannical husband's ploys. Uh, techniques for control that he's been used to. And they over, they've always worked in the past, of course, but now they don't. Something has changed, something has snapped. And she says, no way, man, no way. Even if our culture says that I'm supposed to obey you, no way, perchance Iago, I will never go home. So there's the, there's the voice of a, of a battered wife who has had enough. It's too late, it's too late. She's a Friar Lawrence character. Go back to your Romeo and Juliet and remember how weirdly Friar Lawrence behaves. Is, is he the hero for bringing the two lovers together and healing the wasteland through their love, but at the same time killing them? And then in, in Juliet's tomb, he runs away like a coward 
only to come back later and to reveal all and, and, and say, if I'm to blame, kill me, do you see? So there's, there's that failed hero or the flawed hero who somehow is heroic and unheroic at the same time. Othello is in agony, more agony. I don't know how anyone could be in more agony, but he seems to be. Uh, she was most foul. She was, she was. It is the cause. It is the cause. She is a whore. She is a whore. He's beginning to suspect that he made a terrible mistake, which he suspected all along anyway at some level of his, of his subconscious. And here he's rationalizing again, and he trots out the tired old handkerchief, the MacGuffin, as, as he's trying to convince himself that, yeah, no, I didn't make a mistake. She was a whore. She actually, he actually wants her to be a whore now, which is pretty, pretty sad and pretty ironic because if she's not a whore, then he is a, he is a supreme monster, do you see, which he already knows anyway. He knows that he's a monster. Um, Emilia uh, uh, dis disabuses him of any false notions of the handkerchief being proof of Desdemona's infidelity. She reveals that it was Iago who who, who used the, the handkerchief uh, for nefarious purposes. Okay, and that and that uh, that sets off Iago. He doesn't like the idea. Okay, that his wife is finally talking back to him. So he actually kills her. Okay, as as you know, he 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 kills her. Um, when I read this, it, it reminded me of something. It reminded me of the if you remember, I can't remember which which act it was or which scene it was. But if you if you go back and you remember when Iago and Othello made their pact, that alliance was described in holy terms. It was it was described in terms of a marriage, a marriage union between Othello, uh, a, a, a dark marriage, a, a, a satanic wedding between the two and so here we, we here we see look at this he hath killed his wife who Othello has killed his wife and Iago has killed his wife they're doing the same thing there is the they are the same character now do you see they, they've become they've become one it's 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 really ironic here that it's Iago who is now following Othello's acts it's now Iago that is mimicking Othello whereas throughout the whole inception manipulation scenes it was and once he was incepted it was Othello who was following uh, and mimicking and parroting the words of Iago and now Iago is mimicking the actions of Othello they are one they've become they've become one do you see they are they are both they are both reduced to well Othello is reduced to being a horrible creature and of course Othello uh, Iago always was do you see? Uh, and so chaos ensues. Uh, they're running after Iago. Iago. Iago takes off and some guys run after Iago. Um, and of course, Emilia is dying. And that song, Willow, Willow, she's, Emilia is being laid down next to Desdemona. And there's that pathos again. And Shakespeare pours on the pathos uh, quite thick with the Willow, Willow, Willow song that we've talked about in previous videos. And then, of course, she dies. The authorities, of course, have to arrest Othello, but Othello has a sword and he draws it and he uses it to defend himself. Uh, and he's completely incoherent here. His mind is racing back and forth between uh, the, the crime that he has committed, go cold, cold, my girl. And, and at the same time, he wants to defend himself from his, his uh, not attackers, but you know, from, from the authorities. And he pulls out a sword and he says, this sword has seen me through many, uh, many uh, a, a, a noble, encounter with my foes i used to be a strong man i used to be a tough guy i used to be in control oh vain boasts do you see who can control his fate so i find this interesting this comes up a lot in shakespeare the the notion of fate and i think that shakespeare understood fate as your character character is your destiny we are doomed by our personalities we are the agents of our own destruction it is it's true macbeth it's Macbeth's own character flaws that allow him to be manipulated by the witches who are merely a personification of his own psyche. And, 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 and of course, Lady Macbeth is able to manipulate him because he's weak. Um, do you see? Uh, and of course, the only reason why the noble, of the, 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 the noble and the courageous and the competent Othello is able to be manipulated by Iago only because of his own character, which is, which, which, also contains his insecurity as a black man in Venice, as an outsider in Venice, do you see? And so uh, all throughout here, his, his, uh, his, his psyche is shattered throughout this. He doesn't know what he's, what he's doing. Um, 
moves down here. Lodovico comes back with Iago as the prisoner. They, they managed to track him down and, and, and to hold him and to get a little bit of a confession out of him. And he says, where is this rash and most unfortunate man? Now, it's very interesting that Lodovico calls Othello man. Now, remember, Lodovico had tremendous respect for, uh, for Othello back in Venice, and he still has this that residue of, of, uh, of respect here because he calls, of course, Iago a viper. That's a non-man. Now, it's interesting Lodovico is one of the non-racist guys in the play, and, and it's interesting that Shakespeare brings this back, this contrast between the two. Othello will have none of it. Othello doesn't see himself as a man anymore. He sees himself as a beast, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Let me get to this honor culture thing first. I have, I have so here is the unwinding, the unwinding of, of, of the acts. Othello still stands up and he, he and he accepts his his respon the responsibility for his actions uh, like a man in sharp contrast to the way Iago tries to evade responsibility or or he 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 refuses to reveal everything he refuses to take responsibility he just shuts up and allows himself to be tortured for aught I did in hate but all in honor so he says I uh, it, it he he's he does believe that what he did was with with was mistaken but w did have a noble purpose. And again, fair enough, in the age that this story took place, that murdering a, 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 a deceitful wife would have been something honorable. I'm not sure how it would have been punished by society, uh, but it would have, it would have been um, at least understood, if not uh, uh, completely outlawed by law. Now here's the here's the sharp contrast. Here is Iago as the snake, as the viper, as the serpent, the serpent in the garden. They say, "Come on, confess. Demand me nothing. What you know, you know. From this time forth, I will never speak word." And that's it. That's all we hear from 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 Iago. And that's very very ironic, of course, because he didn't shut up throughout the whole play. If you count all the words that Iago said up until this point, he probably said most of them. Do you see what I'm saying? So again, Shakespeare's trying to contrast. Uh, uh, Iago's baseness with Othello's nobility, his forthrightness, the nobility versus baseness th theme. He's he's too he, he refuses to, to 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 stand up and take responsibility. Whereas, as we will see in his final speech, which we'll look at now, Othello does take responsibility for his actions. Cassio reveals the truth about the handkerchief, confirms the truth about the handkerchief, and Rodrigo's letter confirms the truth of Iago's machinations. The authorities, of course, say, okay, Othello, we're going to arrest you. But before that, Othello wants to have a final word. And it's important. We're going to go through it line by line because uh, it, it's one of his important speeches. It reveals a lot about his character. But soft, soft you, a word or two before you go, I have done the state some service. And they know it, so they owe me something. So Shakespeare puts that in there on purpose to remind us of who Othello is, of what he was, and what he still remains here. He's actually quite composed here. He's actually quite noble and logical here, and, and, and but, but with an added element that we're, that we're actually going to, uh, we're actually going to, you know, deconstruct. Uh, no more of that. Unlike the snaky, sneaky Iago, who doesn't live, who doesn't end nobly. Okay, he doesn't confront his sins. He doesn't confront uh, and confess his crimes and take responsibility for it. Here he says, no. Forget the noble Othello that you knew. I am this debased creature. This is who I am now, and I take responsibility for it. Very, very noble. Not, not all of us could, 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 could take. How many of you can actually truly accept your faults and live, live up to them? It's really, really hard. And when you find someone who does do that, you really admire them, even if they did make a terrible mistake. I pray you in your letters, when you shall these unlucky deeds relate, speak of me as I am, no, nothing extenuate. Speak the whole truth. And what he means by this now is actually the debased self that he is. He wants to be remembered for that, what he is. Don't do anything in malice. Just give the, 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 the objective truth. That's, that's a noble sentiment, you see. Then must you speak of one that loved not wisely but too well. Um, those, those, it's lovely words. It, it, it describes what you know a jealous fool would do it doesn't necessarily he doesn't want to be forgiven he doesn't want to be pardoned he just wants to be understood do you see uh unlike a, a, a snaky husband i suppose who wants to blame everything on everybody else do you see that's 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 what an, a dishonorable person does no he says i am who i am and i take responsibility for it speak of one not easily jealous but being wrought perplexed in the extreme i was confused and that's actually true. We know that that he was at the mercy of a psychopath, and 
And again, we can easily judge Othello for, for the terrible crime that he committed. But when you, are, when you do encounter your psychopath, and you will at some point in your life, you'll do stupid things. You probably won't kill anybody, but you'll do stupid things, and you'll be looking back and saying, oh, my gosh, how, did I, how was I so stupid? You were perplexed in the extreme, okay? Well, at least perplexed. That's what he's talking about. Now, the rest of this is where it gets actually quite interesting. We can start to talk about another theme that, that was touched on th earlier in the play the dangerous barbaric other do you see the dangerous we talked about the dangerous exotic mysterious other we've talked about that already but we haven't talked about it in, in, in quite these harsh terms do you see the base I'm like the base Indian Arabian trees Aleppo is a city in Turkey uh, which is a Muslim place the turbaned Turk the circumcised dog that's a that's a reference to a Muslim he starts to associate himself with the other do you see okay Othello has internalized Iago's racism. Ironically, Othello the more behaves honorably, honest, whereas Iago the Venetian refuses to own up to his guilt. So here's the irony here. Othello does see himself as the barbarian. He has internalized that racism, do you see? Like the base Indian who I threw away a pearl rather richer than all his tribe. Of course, the pearl being Desdemona. Okay, he is like I guess that's 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 a reference to some to some old tale about somebody in India who was base. He was dark skinned and and base. There's our baseness versus nobility. And he threw away what he he didn't he didn't understand what was of value in the world of one whose subdued eyes, albeit unused to the melting mood, drop tears as fast as the Arabian trees their medicinal gum. He's associating him himself the tears that are dropping from the you know the, the tree sap he's associating his own tears with arabian trees do you see set you down this and say besides that in aleppo once where a malignant and turbaned turk beat a venetian and traduced the state i took by the throat the venetian dog the uh uh sorry the uh, the circumcised dog and smote him thus and then he stabs himself so he's he i i took by the throat the turk the alien the other I took him by the throat and I throttled him, okay, because he was attacking a, a, a Venetian. And here I am throttling myself. Here I am killing myself. So he's associated himself. He's basically saying, okay, Venetian guys, you're the good guys. I'm the evil enemy. I'll kill myself, do you see? That's how terrible he feels. Uh, at one level, it's just simply the guilt that he feels. So the enemy of Venice are the Muslims, do you see? So he's going to kill the Muslim, which he sees as himself now, do you see? At a deeper, 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 darker level, it's that internalized racism that, he, that, that Othello's weakness and insecurity as the other allowed him, allowed him to, be, uh, uh, to be susceptible to, do you see? Uh, Othello, brave, dutiful, respected, Reputation in Peripatia. I just wanted to, to remind you, and I already have, of way, way back at the beginning of the play, do you see, he's, he's, he's described as the valiant Moor. Now, Moor is a word of otherness. And the way that it's used previously, I didn't get into it too much here, but the way, the, the, the way that horrible people use Moor is, is as derogatory. But it wasn't always. And the good people don't use it as that. Uh, Desdemona says Moor, her, her, her beloved Moor, do you see? It's not a, it's not a derogatory term, and it, and it doesn't have to be. These don't have to be derogatory terms. But once you've internalized that, that, that ugly otherness that other the, the negative otherness the racism then it, it can be used as something as something horrible very very sad and the pathos continues um othello and in, in his with his dying breath he 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 lies down beside uh desdemona and says i kiss thee ere i before i killed thee no way but this killing myself to die upon a kiss so the only way for me to die is to is to die kissing you so there's there's the theme of love as the redeemer shakespeare allows the union in death okay he he the 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 the, the scene ends with this with this tenderness and there's the pathos there's the catharsis there's the tragedy that's the tragic moment it's a pity and a kind of forgiveness do you see of our it's a forgiveness of our frailty now I, we have all of us frailties not as extreme as this but only because we're not on the stage and we don't everything on the stage is exaggerated do you see what i'm saying our own life's tragedies are are miniature versions of these if you're on the if you're on the big screen or if you're on the stage you have to exaggerate uh the, these these very very human tragedies do you see there's the pity and forgiveness iago will be tortured and die alone 
that's again everything in this play we should be looking we should be thinking of in terms of contrasts you know the nobility of this final scene the, the, the nobility and pathos of this final scene and the pathos perhaps no do we have any sympathy for iago who just says what you know you know i'm not going to say anymore no there's there's no because he's alone there's a, there's a there's a loan but i don't even feel any sadness for his loneliness do you see because he's not lonely he's a psychopath he can't feel lonely you'll live in a prison cell and just you know just be and be content in himself because he doesn't have that connection with humanity that these people have do you see uh there's a question of apotheosis if they are indeed the hero if they are the the masculine principle the cosmic masculine the cosmic feminine if they are that and uh, do they achieve apotheosis apotheosis is when they become uh, gods when the hero dies and becomes a god hercules dies but he is elevated to the state uh, to the status of godhood uh, christ dies and becomes a god that's apotheosis harry potter in the final books dies symbolically and goes into that weird nowhere land to talk to dumbledore that's kind of heaven so there's a there's a kind of apotheosis there that's what heroes do is is this powerful enough is love powerful enough to redeem us is love powerful enough is love is god love is is love god do you see what i'm saying so it, are in that union a holy union are they made uh gods in romeo and juliet they they are literally made into a statue to be worshipped by the town to be remembered by the town and that's a form of apotheosis they've become they've achieved some kind of godhood god status do you see I think so. In the minds of the, in the, in the cathartic experience of the play, we see this and our hearts are awash with pity for humanity. Do you see? And, 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 and reverence, deep, deep reverence for love. Oh my goodness. That's maybe what it is. That's where the apotheosis is achieved. Shakespeare made us revere love and fear non an existence in non-love do you see there it is there it is a grand old theme lovely uh, again it continues here cassio has good words for othello do you see for he was great of heart and that means many many things that means passionate and perhaps too passionate of course uh, with his violence uh, but it also means magnanimous okay um, more is repeated here by Lodovico. I think, I think again, I don't think he means it in, in crude terms. I think he's just talking to, uh, after this great cathartic, pathetic scene, I don't think that's, that's meant in derogatory terms, especially when it's contrasted, as we've been discussing, with uh, uh, his mention of Iago as a hellish villain that shall be tortured and thrown in prison or killed or whatever. So there it is. Love again. Triumphs? In this world, it doesn't. In the minds and the hearts of the audience, I think it does. And that was Five Quote Shakespeare Othello, Act Five and the end of the play. Thanks for watching.